Now, welcome Pr Professor Randy LaPola to give us his, his talk. And the title is The Application of the Comparative Method to Languages in China. Hello, okay. everyone. Uh, can, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, um, very clearly. This is, um, this is a talk actually uh, that um, Professor Wang has already heard a couple of months ago. Um, Sally Koko uh, uh organized a conference in Hong Kong on uh, uh, migration. And I presented it, so he's going to have a strong feeling of deja vu listening to this talk. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when they asked me to uh, present here and I saw the, the, the themes, I thought this was very much apropos uh, for this, this conference. And so I, I figured, okay, uh, I'll present it here as well. So the, um, the history um, of what we're talking about here, um, wait a second, sorry. I'm going. The, as I discussed in some earlier papers and even some recent ones, the origins of what we now call the Chinese and the Sino Tibetans generally are said to have been in the middle reaches of the Yellow River Valley of what is now North China around 6,000 years ago. And um, uh, represented uh, in the Neolithic Yangshao culture. Um, the people at that time were not alone. Uh, uh, there were different independent cultural centers, uh, complexes, cultural complexes in, the, in uh, what we now think of as China at that time. Uh, and there was interaction among them. This is from uh, Zhang Guangzhi's uh, Archaeology of China. Um, because of the uh, because of this, when the residents of the Yellow River Valley migrated east, south, and southeast, they encountered other peoples, cultures, and languages, which influenced the creation of the different Sinitic varieties we find today. It can be said that the history of China is one of migrations, uh, as there have been so many waves of massive migrations throughout its history due to government policy, war, natural disaster, or the pull of economic opportunity. These migrations led to different kinds of contact between the people involved. And so there were different kinds of influence, substratum, adstratum, superstratum, and just a hybridization um, or complete language shift. As I argued earlier, we cannot understand the history of languages without understanding the history of speakers. In all of the current Sinaitic varieties, we see stratified remnants of uh, different influences and recent work in identifying the different strata through internal comparative work and the linking of those strata with historical migrations has led to great advancements in our understanding of the history of the varieties. In this paper, I'll focus on the development of the Gan, Hakka, and especially Min varieties uh, based largely on the work of Jerry Norman and South Coblin using natural language data and the traditional comparative method. The implications of their findings are the main point of this paper, pointing out how we have been misled in the past by a problematic methodology and neglect of human history. The following three maps show us the current locations of the Southeastern Sinitic varieties, the Hmong Mian languages, and the uh, Dai Kadai languages. So the, the varieties I'm going to be talking about in the Southeast corner of this image, the Gan, Hakka, and Min, and slightly touch on Wu. Um, these are uh, the current locations of these and pretty much has always been the same. Whereas with the Hmongic and the Dai Kadai, uh, we, we now see is just scattered remnants of this language family, but they would have been much more extensive in the past. Uh, this is the Dai Kadai languages, uh, which again would have been more extensive in the past. So the origin of the Southeastern varieties, um, here I'll only talk about some of the major migrations and their effects. There were many, many migrations of different sizes throughout Chinese history, some long distance, some short distance, but there were lots and lots of them. I have a partial list of some of the bigger ones in uh, my 2001 paper on migration and its influence on Sino-Tibetan. Uh, but you can also check the original sources uh, uh, James Lee from Harvard, uh, they've got a, particularly this Go Wu and Cao is a six volume history of migration in China. The first area just so I need to mention is the Jiangdong area, the eastern end of the uh, Yangtze River. Um, roughly 
2,500 years ago, there was an early southeastern migration from the central plains into the Jiangdong area during the Eastern Zhou Dynasty. There were already people living in the area, as we saw from the map from Zhang Guangzhi, um, called the Bai Ye, uh, who may have been, uh, the Chinese called them Bai Ye, we don't actually know who they were, uh, but they may have been Austroasiatic speaking, according to Norman and May and Pulleyblank. This is the area, by the way, where rice was first cultivated around 9,000 years ago. It so it has uh, its inclusion in the, the Sinitic um, cultural area was, was quite important. After the fall of the Western Jin Dynasty in 316 CE, a major change occurred in the area. Um, uh, and large numbers of Northern Steppes people in the uh, moved into the Central Plains um, and then uh, up to a million people from the central, original central plains migrated into the Jiangxi, Zhejiang, Jiangsu area, trying to escape the situation in the north known as the chaos of the Yongjia period. The migrants into the south included the former aristocracy of Jian, plus, as Kablan points out, a large number of other migrants from Shandong and northern Jiangsu, as well as Henan, Hebei, Shan, Shanxi, and Shanxi. Uh, this migration affected the language spoken in the area, uh, which we now call the Wu area, variety area, which will become important when we talk about the formation of the Min varieties. An even larger second major migration from the north into the southeast of interest to, to us was caused by the Anlu Shan Rebellion uh, during the Tang Dynasty. This migration began in the, the mid-8th century and continued up until the mid-10th century. This again led to a change in the area to a more northern type of, of Sinitic variety in those areas where large numbers of the northerners settled. A still larger third major wave of migration of millions of people occurred after the fall of the northern Song dynasty in the early 12th century that affected much of the south. We'll be mentioning these migrations in terms of how they affected the southeastern varieties we'll be discussing. Um, so first I want to talk about Gan, Haka, and Shu. Uh, migration of specific interest to us in terms of the development of these languages um, is the migration of one-fifth of the 500,000 troops and settlers the first emperor sent to conquer the south in the third century BCE into the south central part of what is now China. This branch of the army and its followers moved through the Poyang uh, Lake Valley and into the Gan River watershed in central and northern Jiangxi and led to the development of the Gan and Hakka varieties of Sinitic. A part of that branch of the army and settlers moved further up the Gan River into the south central highlands that cover parts of southern Jiangxi, western Fujian, northeastern Guangdong, and west into the southeastern corner of Hunan instead of garrisons there. The garrison settlements continued through the Han period, and there was gradual increase in Sinitic speakers into the area particularly of non-military settlers in both the lower and higher areas. Coblin calls the variety of Chinese that formed from the northern varieties of Chinese brought into the Gan area during that period, early South Central Chinese. Coblin posits two subtypes of this early South Central Chinese. Uh, one spoken in the northern lowlands, which became what we now think of as the Gan variety. And one spoken in the Southern Highlands, which developed into what we now think of as the Hakka varieties. This is a map of the area we're talking about. Um, the uh, orange area is the so-called Hakka heartland, and then the olive area is the Shu, um, uh, uh, the ancestral Shu area. Um, this early South Central Highland variety was already the result of contact between earlier and later settlers, but then migration through the Poyang uh, region and further south up the Gan River increased after the Anlu Shan Rebellion of the mid 8th century and continued through the fall of the Tang Dynasty and into the mid 10th century. A second major wave of migration from the north into Jiangxi occurred after the fall of the Northern Song Dynasty in the early 12th century and the push by the Jurchen South. In the ensuing several hundred years, there was a blending of the different cultural and linguistic strata, that's, that is the Aboriginal, the early Central Highland strata, the 
post Anlushan strata and the post Northern Song collapse strata into a sim single complex Semitic language variety. So it's kind of a hybrid variety and culture, which Coblin calls New South Central Highlands Chinese. From the early 16th century to the mid 17th century, there was economic expansion in the lower areas that attracted migrants from the highlands. As these highlanders had their own language and culture, they were seen as strangers and called Hakka or Kujia, uh, people from elsewhere or guests. Those who stayed in the highlands were not called by this name until modern linguists started doing so. But with later economic downturns and conflict between the lowland people and those they called Hakka, the latter, uh, the Hakka, continued to migrate farther afield as far as Sichuan. The She also at uh, around this time, due to conflict with the Sinaitic settlers in the highlands and the economic opportunities in the lowlands, started migrating out of the highlands, some together with what were called the Hakka, some on their own path southeastward into Guangdong and Fujian, and in some cases up the coast into Zhejiang. While they often kept to themselves, they did interact with the Hanchen and picked up linguistic influences as they did, or in some cases, fully assimilated. So now we turn to Min, which is really the key of all of this, uh, the main point of my talk, actually. Until the end of the Eastern Han Dynasty, there was no appreciable Sinaitic population in what is now the Min area. Okay, this is a really important point, so I'm going to repeat it. We don't find evidence of Sinaitic, appreciable Sinaitic population in Fujian until around the beginning of the third century. That's a that's something that most people do not at all take into consideration. They consider Min as having always been part of the Chinese cultural, intellectual, cultural area. But uh, this was actually quite late in terms of Chinese history. Currently, the Min branch manifests many historical strata. And in fact, as Coblin and Shen Rei Qing argue, based on ideas first put forward by Jerry Norman, it manifests the results of not fully completed convergence of three or more unnameable pre-Min Sinaitic varieties that were due to different migration patterns. One stratum is not Sinaitic, the languages or the language or languages of what we are called, uh, what were called the Min Yue, uh, one of the hundred year, possibly again, Austroasiatic speakers, we're not sure. There are also several Sinaitic strata that can be linked to migrations of different times and from different places. One stratum is the language of the first Chinese settlers into Fujian during the latter, uh, no, not into Fujian, into uh, Zhejiang. Uh, one stratum is uh, during the latter part of the Eastern Han Dynasty. Um, and, oh no, this is the into Fujian, yeah. Um, they entered the Northwestern part of Fujian from Southwestern and Central Zhejiang which had been populated by migrants from the area just north of that area, which is what I was confusing there, such as Hunan, Shandong, Jiangsu, and Anhui at the end of the second century uh, of the current era. So this is all relatively late when we think in terms of the vastness of Chinese history. Somewhat later, there was migration from Jiangxi in the west into northwestern Fujian, and the two sets of migrants converged in that area. So, what this means is that you had, I just talked about how the Gan and Hakka varieties were formed in Jiangxi. And then you had migrations from this area, which was already an amalgamation of several different waves of, um, of migrations and their languages uh, amalgamated into a certain particular kind of phonetic variety. And that variety, then some of those people migrated into Northwestern Fujian, and then they merged again with migrants from north of that area. And so you had, a, again, the convergence of a convergence, um, and the, you know, a hybridization of several different things coming together. A separate migration from the north, which began at the end of the third century CE, was by sea down from the Wenzhou area along the coast, possibly by Sinicized Yue and the Oro people who were known to be good sailors. Coblin uh, summarizes these three migrations in the following map based on Bielenstein. So the, the yellow uh, arrows coming down is the 
migrations from south southwestern Zhejiang into the Minbei area, the northern Fujian area. Uh, the orange coming from the west is the migrations from eastern Jiangxi into far western Fujian. And the uh, purple uh, arrows are um, the coastal migrations from the Wenzhou area to the eastern part the, uh, of Fujian. Koblen suggests that the western and coastal migrations developed into two different linguistic varieties, which he calls Premin B and Premin A, respectively, which later converged around 300 of the current era to give us common Min, the initial ancestor of the modern Min variety. So here, when we talk about common Min or proto Min, uh, it would be around, uh, it would have formed around 300 CE. But actually, given the differences between inland and coastal Min and the inability to reconstruct a single common Min form for many lexical items, Koblen suggests the convergence is not fully complete. Uh, see also Shen Ri Qing's uh, most recent uh, conference paper on how the features that Norman, uh, Jerry Norman and Ding Bang Xin used to argue that Min is a direct descendant of the Wu dialect of the Southern dynasties are actually only found in coastal Min. There were also large migrations due to the Anlu Shan rebellion in the Tang dynasty and the Tang dynasty literary form of the Tang Koine that affected the languages. Fujian was also affected by the migrations after the fall of the Song dynasty in the early 12th century, and now there's the influence of modern Mandarin. There are two important conclusions we can make from looking at the history of migrations and language developments in the Min area. Um, as the Min branch is not reflected in the 601 CE rhyme book Chie Yun, which is a rhyme book uh, that is an amalgamation of a number of different uh, rhyming practices, uh, of uh, poetic practices um, based on earlier rhyme books, based on the speech of, or the educated speech and reading practices of several different areas within China at the time. Um, so this was a not a single language. Uh, it was a, an amalgamation of reading practices. Um, but because the Min branch is not reflected in that book, um, it's often assumed that that branch is an earlier split from the rest of Chinese. This was Colgren's idea uh, in 1954. Um, Akitani 2020 has a very good critical assessment of this idea that, um, and of course, Kalgren and, and Jerry, no uh, Kalgren, uh, Kalgren and Jerry Norman in their 1995 paper criticized the whole idea of the Cheyun being an actual language. But it may actually be that the branch, um, the, the mean branch had not yet fully formed as a distinct entity, as we saw that it was it formed quite late or it was simply was not something the writers of the Chiyun were aware of or cared about at that time, as the area was not fully integrated into the intellectual life of China at the time. And this may be why when the, uh, the Min people uh, talk about themselves in Min, they call themselves Tang people, Tang Lang, instead of Han people, and call China Tang Mountain, uh, Tang Suan, um, uh, because they really weren't integrated into the intellectual life of China until the, the Tang period. Um, and also the word for house in, um, in, in Min uh, generally is uh, actually goes back to the word uh, Shu, which means um, uh, 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 military, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, it was a, like a borderland, uh, um, the place where soldiers live on the borderland. I can't I think of the English word now. My English is, uh, this is cognitive decline uh, that uh, Professor Wong was just talking about. I, I'm losing my English. Um, so um, so this, I think, can explain uh, some of the things in, actually, in itself. Um, When people write about the different genetic varieties, it's common for them to refer to a family tree such as the following. And particularly this one, I uh, 
has old Chinese uh, and then split into a bifurcation of Min and Middle Chinese. Uh, and then all of the other varieties coming out of Middle Chinese. But um, this is um, not something that I, I think is helpful. Following Jerry Norman in South Coblen, I want to argue that this is unrealistic. They dismiss Colgren's idea that all of the Sinitic varieties except me arose out of his philological interpretation of the Chiyun rhyme book and instead work from data of the spoken modern varieties and use the comparative method to reconstruct empirically based earlier stages of the different groups. For those who want to understand the method or who think Chinese can't be analyzed using the comparative method, see Coblen 2021b and I'll show you the reference in a minute. They also do not uh, see neat family trees coming out of their work. Biologists now accept the idea that hybridization is not something unusual in evolution and the creation of new species, but is instead a regular feature of evolution as combinatorial speciation or intragressive hybridization or reticulate evolution. And so instead of neat family trees, they're using web-like images to represent relationships. For example, the image below from Vernon 1995 talking about the development of coral. So you can see that it's not a nice neat tree structure. It comes from a common source, but then there are branching and then reconnecting. Um, and this is what's been happening with languages when they're um, merging together. Sometimes they all, of course, come from a common source but they split and remerge in different ways. In linguistics, languages are also not easily represented by neat trees as they are more or less the result of coalescence, contact, and influence. I will end with a quote from Coblen that summarizes the conception. Our view here is that demographic history uh, suggests waves and flowage rather than discrete branches which have diverged and developed independently according to a tree type model. In speaking of the relationship between Gan and Hakka, he says, a, a configuration of this type is not inherently susceptible to absolute demarcations, nor is it easily characterizable in terms of a distinct set of shared innovations in separate branches of a tree. This is because it was produced by fluid demographic dy dynamics rather than by neat stambam type bifurcations. These families are related by the fact that they have been subject to the same demographic processes, but that they differ in the manners in which they have been influenced by these processes. Okay, thank you. And let me show you the uh, Coblen, this is 21 the top of the page here, Coblen 2021b, 20, oh, sorry. Uh, a problem in the application of the comparative method to reconstruction of earlier forms of Chinese. Uh, this one is not yet published, but if anybody wants a copy of it, I can send it to them. Hopefully that will, will come out soon. Um, okay, so that's the, the end of my talk. Um, I'm open for questions. We have pretty good time here. Yeah. Thank you, Professor La Pola. Uh, now we still have uh, six minutes for questions. Uh, okay, uh, if there's no question, I, I want to raise, oh, oh uh, uh, Professor Chukhova, please. Um, hello, uh, Randy, thank you very much for the lecture. 
uh, greatly Hi. appreciated it. It's not that hello <laughs> that I have. Uh, well, I do have a question, but it's more like a general comment. Um, and I do um, readily recognize uh, the, the problem. And uh, I myself worked even a little bit on that in relation to the area where I work and where the problem is also uh, of a similar type of the difficulty of hybridization and of uh, complexity of processes that are involved in language change and language development at the South, Southwest China, um, Chinese area in particular. Mm. My question is, in, in that connection, um, we, well, it's, uh, now it seems like uh, the field is ready for new methodology. And uh, I was wondering, we have the comparative method as one cornerstone in, in historical studies. Are there any concrete proposals on how to work with these types of complex situations in China? Maybe as an addition to the comparative method or well, just the methodology that you raised at the beginning, what are the concrete proposals that are on the table or we are still not yet at that stage? Uh, well, the important thing is merging um, the comparative method. Uh, we don't have something separate from the comparative method. It's just, but it's quite different from the traditional yin yun xie, you know, xiao xie or whatever you want to call it. Uh, method in China where you where you just ask people to pronounce characters and then you trace those characters uh, the pronunciation of those characters to the Chiyun categories. So what they had been arguing, what Jerry Norman and and uh, uh, South Cobblin have been arguing for quite some time now, is a really new methodology for China, uh, which is to use natural data, not this just reading characters from a character list. Uh, we use natural data and then uh, use internal reconstruction and also comparative reconstruction um, to identify the different strata of the words within it. Um, I mean, so this has been done to some extent on some minority languages like Sagar, uh, 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 Sagat's work on Bai uh, and, and some other varieties. Um, but uh, in Chinese dialects, this hasn't been done quite as much. So what he has done is very painstaking um, comparative work, identifying the different, many different strata within each variety, and then trying to um, show the relationship between that particular strata and the migration, a particular migration. So this is really, really solid type of work that they're doing. Uh, there's a, it's, it's not just Koblen, actually. It, 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 it's a group of young Chinese linguists doing it. There's very few people outside China doing it. It's a really mainly just Koblen now outside China. But there are some young people like Sun Ray Ching and, and other people who are, uh, who are doing this inside China. And it's actually more young Chinese people who are doing it, which is very encouraging to me because I'd like to see more people get involved in this because they can do the field work. And they are doing the field work now. You're, you're seeing much more uh, empirical work being done on um, uh, these non-Mandarin varieties. Um, so this is a, a very new methodology, actually, for for China. And so, um, uh, particularly, like I said, identifying the strata and then trying to match those strata with what we know about human migration or the migrations of those speakers. Uh, or the, the people who migrated into that area and became those speakers. But thanks for that question. That's a good, I should, I should have clarified that from the beginning. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, there's still one minute and we'll have time for a quick question. Did, is there, is there any question? I would expect a lot of resistance to this because I myself spent years and years trying to learn the whole Chia Yun system and things like that. I studied with at Beida, uh, with two different professors at Beida and also with Zhang Kun in Berkeley and trying to master this system. And now, um, you know, thinking that this is actually the wrong way to do uh, to, to try to understand dialects. Um, so um, I, I can understand there's gonna be a lot of resistance for people like me who have 
spent so much time learning this system and now it's saying we should really do something different. But actually when I present this, I don't I don't get much feedback at all. So thank you. So it's kind of interesting. Either people just dismissing it out of hand or they um haven't really quite got the point of what I'm saying. Mm, yeah, that's why we need more discussion. Yeah. Uh okay. Uh so uh time is up. Uh, now let's well, uh, thank Professor La Paula again, uh, and now we uh, welcome Professor uh, Chen Baoya's talk. Uh, 